What kind of world did our Ice Age ancestors inhabit? Numerous scientific techniques have been applied for decades to answer this question. Thanks to sedimentology, pollen analysis, and the detailed study of fauna and flora, along with dating methods, we now have a comprehensive understanding of the environments in which they lived and how they changed. What do you say? Let's try and step into the shoes of those before us who did everything to keep themselves alive in those difficult times. The Quaternary period, which began around 2.6 million years ago, experienced approximately 12 climatic cycles, each lasting about 115,000 years. Each cycle consisted of a warm period, followed by a cold period of similar length. The most recent interglacial cycle commenced approximately 130,000 years ago and concluded 11,000 years ago, characterized by temperatures oscillating at every stage. Presently, we are in a warm phase, known as the Holocene or post-glacial period. During the last glacial period, there were cold and dry episodes interspersed with periods relatively mild and humid. Within the period of interest, there were around 12 warm phases between approximately 41,000 and 13,000 years ago, with a peak of coldness occurring around 20,000 years ago. However, the subsequent warming was not continuous, featuring shorter and progressively milder cold phases. Each cold phase was preceded by intense precipitation, resulting in more winter snowfall than summer melting, which led to the expansion of glaciers southward and downward. Consequently, the dry and cold episodes were characterized by minimal vegetation, primarily consisting of grass and coniferous trees. The soil dried out and was pulverized by freezing, subsequently being deposited on plains and plateaus as loess. However, in certain regions like Western Iberia and parts of the Mediterranean, the last glacial maximum was cold yet humid. During milder phases, rainfall increased, accompanied by lusher vegetation such as grassy steppes, shrubs and a greater variety of trees. The animal species also varied accordingly. In the period known as the last glacial maximum, which was the coldest phase, Winters were long and harsh, while summers were short and mild. Estimating temperatures precisely is challenging due to the wide range of microclimates. In close proximity to the ice, the coldest times were likely 10 degrees to 15 degrees Celsius lower than today. In Western Europe, it is improbable that the average temperatures dip below 10 to 15 degrees Celsius during the coldest phase, while the average summer maximum ranged between 5 and 10 degrees Celsius. Extremes were around minus 20 degrees Celsius in winter and plus 17 degrees Celsius in July. In other words, winters were as severe as in present-day Lapland, but summers were longer and warmer. Rainfall during this time was estimated to be between 30 and 70 centimeters per year, although these values are approximations. In Europe, temperatures during the Magdalenian period were believed to be approximately 5 degrees Celsius lower than today, similar to Norway. Consequently, daily caloric requirements would have increased by several dozens, assuming individuals had adequate warm clothing. During the colder phases, massive masses of ice several kilometers thick stretched across northern Europe, reaching the northern coast of Ireland, northern Germany and southern Sweden, while the Alps and the Pyrenees were covered up to the plains below. During the coldest periods, a significant amount of water was trapped in ice, causing sea levels to recede. The Atlantic coasts of Brittany and Aquitaine, for instance, were pushed approximately 100 kilometers further out. There was no channel, and Britain was joined to mainland Europe. In warmer periods, sea levels rose again, and the coasts were submerged. As a result, many coastal sites and evidence from the coldest periods have been lost. Changes in the coastline would have made marine resources more or less accessible. There were significant variations within and between regions, in other words, landscapes were never uniform. During cold periods, forests disappeared and grassy steppes took over, while temperate periods saw the partial return of trees. Near the ice, there were dry, inhospitable windswept plains, similar to tundra. However, it is crucial to note that the landscapes of Europe have changed. We cannot see what the Paleolithic humans saw. Many aspects have changed, especially the course of rivers, their levels, and the location of fords. 
the Pleistocene environment is gone and has no equivalent today. Okay, all this regarding climate and environment, but what about animals? During the lush and moderate phases, when temperate and humid conditions prevailed, large herbivores underwent transformations in response to the changing vegetation. The valley bottoms and woodland clearings were teeming with magnificent creatures like the red deer, along with the megaloceros, an extinct giant deer known for its impressive three-meter antlers. Moose thrived in the northern regions of Germany, adding to the diverse ecosystem. During the cold and arid glacial period, a different set of animals emerged. Ibex and chamois descended from the lofty peaks, while horses, bison, and reindeer flourished on the vast steppes. These ancient horses were characterized by their small yet sturdy build, resembling the modern Chowalski and Tarpon breeds. The steppe bison, which roamed the Ice Age lands of Europe, has sadly become extinct. It surpassed the modern European bison in size, reaching heights of two meters at the shoulder and weighing nearly a ton. The aurochs, a wild ox species, matched them in both size and weight. The migrating reindeer ventured north during temperate phases, but never made it past northern Spain. Interestingly, the North Spanish caves showcase remarkable depictions of reindeer, indicating their novelty in the region. In contrast, reindeer were less commonly depicted in France, despite their higher population there. During the harshest cold phases, the steppes hosted additional fascinating creatures, such as the saiga antelope, mammoths, and woolly rhinos. Like the reindeer, mammoths were restricted to northern Spain and were sparsely depicted in the region. As for rhinos, their depictions have yet to be discovered in Iberia. The presence of numerous carnivores further added to the intricate ecosystem, preying on the herbivores. The omnivorous cave bear stood tall at over 2.5 meters and weighed around 400 kilograms. The smaller brown bear thrived in the cold phases as well as in forested areas. The cave lion, significantly larger than its modern-day counterparts, struggled in extreme cold conditions. Unlike the adaptable wolverine and arctic fox, wolves and foxes, on the other hand, showcase their remarkable adaptability in any environment. Additional cold-adapted or high-altitude species included the arctic hare, weasel, lemming, snow vole, and marmot. Bird species varied depending on the climate phases. Cold periods saw the presence of ptarmigan, willow grass, and snowy owls. During temperate phases, the avian diversity expanded with a particular emphasis on water species in artistic depictions. Birds' eggs were also consumed, providing a valuable source of protein and lipids. The artistic records reveal fascinating glimpses of marine life as well. Depictions of flat sea fish and occasional sightings of whales, both at sea and washed up on beaches, were captured in art. In the cave of Le Mat des Îles in the French Pyrenees, an ibex was carved on a fresh catholic tooth. While at Los Caldas in Asturias, a whale was engraved on an actual whale tooth. Additionally, sealed depictions and remains provide insights into their presence, with some suggesting these animals ventured upstream. Inland areas boasted an abundance of river fish, particularly salmon and trout, as evidenced by hundreds of artistic depictions and numerous remains. Obviously, all this could not have been achieved without the control of a heat source. Humans may have achieved the controlled use of fire at least a million years ago. If so, then by the last ice age, there must have been tremendous expertise in making fire, maintaining it and transporting it. Fire afforded warmth, protection, lighting and a means of cooking, as well as smoking meat, fish and hides. It makes starches and animal protein more digestible, detoxifies many foods and kills worms and parasites. Fire can also be used for heating flints and changing the colors of pigments and, of course, for keeping threatening animals at a distance. It would also be relatively easy to build the kind of specialized fire needed to send smoke signals to pass information. Contrary to widespread popular myth, one can't make fire by hitting two flints or quartzites together. Any sparks produced are too weak and short-lived but it can be done by striking flint and iron pyrites together and directing the resulting sparks at tinder or dried fungus. This method became common in the Mesolithic and Neolithic periods. Fire, spears, cooperation among hunting groups, traps, all of this, however, could not fail to affect the fauna of the Ice Age. But it is perhaps in the Americas that during the last glaciation, there was the greatest and strangest concentration of animals that then suddenly became extinct. I'm talking about the so-called megafauna, 
composed of mammals of unusual size. There were several species of wild horses and camels, and armadillo relative to the size of a small car, and giant ground sloths, as well as short-faced bears, dire wolves, saber-toothed cats, and scimitar-toothed cats. There were somewhat larger versions of our contemporary cheetahs and lions, and there were several species of mastodons and mammoths, relatives of living elephants. All of those large, new world mammals are now gone, vanished in a heartbeat of geological time. And yet, almost all of the plants and smaller species that lived with them persist today. Imagine a world with only half the variety of large animals that we know today. Imagine an Africa without lions, gorillas and hippos, an Australia without kangaroos and a North America with no bison. Without realizing it, we are in exactly this situation today. In what paleontologists have begun to call near time, the last 50,000 years, datable by radiocarbon, the world lost half of its 200 genera of large mammals. Beyond the living bears, bison, deer, moose, and other large mammals familiar to us now, an additional 30 genera and over 40 species lived in North America, and even more in South America. Most of the Western Hemisphere's characteristic large mammals no longer exist. As a result, without knowing it, Americans live in a land of ghosts. Some of these magnificent creatures, the extinct megafauna, are only seen in popular museum displays in our major cities. Many of their names are unfamiliar to most of us. North America lost mastodons, gomphotheres, and four species of mammoths, ground sloths, glyptodont, and giant armadillos, giant beavers, and giant peccaries, stag moose, and dwarf antelopes, brush oxen and woodland musk oxen, native camels and horses, bears, dire wolves, saber-toothed and dirk-toothed cats, and an American subspecies of the king of the beasts itself, the lion. The short-faced bear, Arctodus, surpassed all living bears in size and probably in speed. The famous saber-toothed tiger, Smilodon, was about the size of today's African lion, with curved upper canines measuring 18 centimeters in length, while the canines of scimitar cat, Homo thurium, were only 10 centimeters long. Other carnivores included a subspecies of lion, Panthera leo atrox, as well as the dire wolf, Canis dirus. South America also experienced significant losses. Extinction affected numerous species of ground sloths, with one monster weighing over 4,500 kilograms. Baird's tarpa, which weighs only around 300 kilograms, is currently the largest native herbivore in the New World tropics. Australia also witnessed the disappearance of its own giant animals. Although not as massive as those in the Americas, they included wombat-like creatures the size of rhinos, kangaroos larger than any living kangaroo, various other large marsupials, and even oversized koalas and echidnas. All of these animals existed on Earth until well into the lifespan of our own species. So, why are they no longer here today? Many people believe that all wild animal extinctions in the past 50,000 years are anthropogenic, meaning caused by humans. The decline of the American megafauna has been a topic of debate for decades, a puzzle whose solution lies between two hypotheses. The first hypothesis emerged in the 1960s and revolves around our own species. Around 14,000 years ago, as humans spread across North America, they assumed the role of super predators. We are a highly social species capable of creating weapons and hunting large game. On the other hand, these large animals lacked appropriate anti-predator behaviors to survive. Therefore, humans likely drove every species above a certain size to rapid extinction. However, many scientists argue that the archaeological evidence supporting the idea of widespread megafauna hunting causing extinctions is too scarce. Instead, they attribute the decline to climate changes that occurred during the few thousand years separating the megafauna from the brink of extinction. Around 14,700 years ago, North America experienced a period of warming, followed by a sudden glaciization 12,900 years ago, enveloping the continent in a polar climate. Thus, the final blow to the North American megafauna was delivered by the last glaciation. However, this does not absolve humans entirely, as the arrival of our species in many parts of the planet coincides with large-scale extinction events. In Europe and Asia, the extinction of large mammals, starting with the woolly mammoths of Northern Europe, occurred much earlier. 
Rising temperatures and human overhunting pushed the large herd of herbivores further north, along with the carnivores that preyed on them. Their adaptation to increasingly colder climates left them ill-prepared when temperatures abruptly rose. One notable example is the story of the woolly mammoth, which became increasingly isolated in the Siberian tundra, dwindling in numbers. The final extinction of the species occurred north of Siberia, on what is now Wrangell Island, a mere 3,500 years ago. The question that lingers, as always, tempers the melancholy that inevitably settles upon us when we discuss these matters. What caused these periodic glaciations on our planet? The answer is not a simple one. The main cause could be attributed to the astronomical nature of Earth's orbit, which undergoes cyclic changes, altering the distances between the Earth and its perihelion and aphelion. Similarly, the variable inclination of the Earth's axis plays a role. However, we mustn't neglect other possibilities, such as continental drift and its impact on large ocean currents or the shifting of the poles. That's all for now, folks. But let's never forget that regardless of the perception from which we approach these changes, they're not merely part of our past, but will also shape our future. Ours and that of all the creatures with whom we share life on this planet.